Okay, so we've now discussed what hyperplexia produces. It's this stiff baby syndrome where the babies suffer from muscle stiffness uh, and also increased startle responses. And often, 25% of them uh, die. They don't reach their third birthday. Uh, and it's because they stop breathing. They suffer from apnea, which leads to asphyxiation. Okay. Um, and the nice thing, the good news, is that if they do make it to their third birthday, uh, it sorts itself out, basically. Uh, something changes, so the body adapts, basically. It realises that uh, the inhibitory interneurons aren't working properly and makes uh, modifications to ensure that that's not a problem. Okay, um, so... Um, well, actually, it's not the inhibitory interneurons fault, it's the glycine receptor or postsynaptic V's fault. Okay, so one last thing that I want to talk to you about is concerning the genetics of hyperplexia. So initially, we saw mutations like this, and we found that they were inherited in a dominant manner. And let me just refresh your ma memory of what dominant and recessive mean. So basically, we all have two copies of the gene for the glycine receptor. We have a copy that was from our mother and a copy that was from our father. So let me draw these two out. So here's our DNA. Here's a picture of DNA. Here's another piece of DNA. And these represent the two genes that we have. So let's say this is the paternal gene and this is the maternal gene. Right. So if a condition is dominant, then it means that only one of these genes needs to be uh, a mutant gene. So this P250T is dominant. So you only need one of your beta receptor subunits to be this P250T in order to get the disease. Okay, so this is a dominant form of hyperplexia. Then the other uh, gene for this beta subunit of the glycine receptor, so this is the beta subunit, I'll just put that, that can be perfectly normal. So this person where they've got a normal beta subunit and then one that's got this mutation, they will get hyperplexia. Okay, and that's an example of dominant. Now recessive is when you need uh, both of the genes to be mutated in order for you to get the disease. So um, certain mutations in the beta subunit require both of the genes to be that mutant in order for you to become hyperplexic. So, let me give you examples of the reason that some of um, the mut mutations that cause hyperplexia are dominant, whilst others are recessive. Okay, so the ones that are dominant are like P250T. They are ones which generally will be integrated into the um, pentameric glycine receptor. So this is very, very important. Remember that when we're building one of these glycine receptors, it does not just consist of a single subunit. So I'm going to draw this picture again because it is extremely important. The receptor consists of five separate subunits that are put together. And the main form of the receptor that is found in the human body is this alpha-1 beta form. So all of these receptors have at least, um, well, have a few beta subunits in. They all have some beta subunits in, at least one. Okay, right. So, dominant, uh, the dominant condition will produce you a, well, if you, if you have a mutation that is dominant, which means that you only need one of them to be mutant, so one of our beta subunits is mutant, the other isn't, then it will cause hyperplexia if it is put into the receptor, into the pentamer. So it has to be put into the pentamer. So the mutation isn't bad enough that it's not put into the receptor. So some of the mutations, and these are going to be the recessive ones, are so bad that they don't even get put into the receptor. And you might think, but that's surely worse. That surely should be the dominant one. But no, you'll see the logic in a moment. So the dominant ones are put into the receptor. Okay? And then 
what they will cause in that receptor is some sort of dysfunction. They will make this glycine receptor completely dysfunctional. So maybe they will stop the binding of glycine, maybe would be an example. Stop the binding of glycine. Um, we've also seen this P250T, um, which stops, um, well, slows down the desensitization the return from desensitization so much that basically the glycine receptor becomes unusable. Okay, so that was another example. Uh, another example uh, of a mutation uh, in the beta receptor that would be um, dominant would be if it was incorporated into the receptor and then it didn't, it bound glycine but then wouldn't undergo the conformational change to open. Okay, so if you had some mutation in the beta, uh, subunit that meant that when you incorporated that beta subunit, that mutant beta subunit into your pentamer, it, the pole pentamer just doesn't open when glycine binds. Okay, so these will be examples of dominant, um, dominant conditions, okay? So why? Well, because if you m have one of these mutants, then you'll produce that mutant and it will be incorporated into these pentamers and then it will make that receptor completely dysfunctional. Okay, so it's going to cause complete drop in the function of the glycine receptors which are on the alpha motor neuron. Okay, not all of them will be dysfunctional because you've still got one functional beta subunit and when you're lucky enough to have a pentamer that has only normal beta subunits in, then that will still function. But all the ones that have the mutant beta subunit in, those will not function. Okay, so you'll have a bunch of useless glycine receptors on the membrane of your alpha motor neuron and that will considerably reduce the inhibitory neurotransmission onto that alpha motor neuron. It will reduce the inhibitory postsynaptic currents that the alpha motor neuron receives and therefore it will cause the overactivity of that alpha motor neuron because the excitatory postsynaptic currents will now be unmasked, they'll be unneutralized by the inhibitory postsynaptic currents. Okay, now the recessive mutations are bizarrely generally more severe mutations. So in the recessive mutations, what generally happens is maybe uh, you get a nonsense mutation that means that the protein is synthesized only half, basically. So a stop mutation is when, uh, sorry, a nonsense mutation is when uh, you add in a premature stop codon into the mRNA and the protein is only is terminated too early. So let me just remind you of the central dogma. Okay, so we have our DNA here. Okay, the DNA then produces mRNA. Okay, so here's our piece of mRNA, which is then translated into a protein. So here's the ribosome reading the mRNA. Now the ribosome stops uh, the translation of the mRNA into protein, so here's the polypeptide coming out here, it stops it when it receives a codon that has no tRNA uh, that has a complementary anticodon, okay? And these codons are known as stop codons, okay? So there are three stop codons, there are three combinations of organic bases uh, that tell the ribosome to stop translation, basically. Now, if you undergo a mutation that puts in one of these stop codons too early in the mRNA, then what will happen is the ribosome will stop translating far too early, and it will only make a fragment of the full protein. Okay, and when that happens, that's known as a nonsense mutation, because what you end up with is a useless, basically. So, nonsense mutations would be an example of recessive. Um, Okay, so basically, recessive mutations are mutations that are so bad that it is not incorporated into the pentama. So, not incorporated into the pentama. Okay, into pentama. So, all of the uh, glycine receptors you produce will... Oh, actually, I need to say something more before I say that. So, if you've only got one copy of this... Uh, recessive mutants. Let's say one of them has a mutation that's so bad that it leads to a protein that is unrecognizable, basically, and is therefore not incorporated into the glycine receptor pentamer. Okay, but then you've got one normal one, then 
only the normal one will actually be incorporated into the glycine receptors. So all the glycine receptors that you produce will have this um, beta sub, this normal beta subunit in them, and therefore will function. Now you might say, oh well, great, but you'll produce surely far fewer because one of your genes is totally useless. But it doesn't hold that way because the level of receptors at the cell membrane is extremely tightly regulated. Basically, there are extremely tight mechanisms for making sure that there are fixed number of receptors at the uh, postsynaptic membrane. So, when you produce too few receptors because you've got uh, one gene totally defunctional, what will happen is this other gene will just be continuously activated to produce more beta subunits until you have enough glycine receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So basically you'll just upregulate the expression of the healthy one and it will just cope basically it will uh, do the work of the unhealthy one okay uh, so um, you won't notice that you've got this mutation here basically it won't cause you any problem you'll have the right number of glycine receptors in the postsynaptic membrane and they'll all be functional now that the only way this can cause a disease therefore is if you have two of them that have this really severe mutation if you have two of them that have the really severe mutation this one has a really severe mutation and this one has a really severe mutation then you don't get any functional beta subunit made and therefore you don't make any functional glycine receptors and if you have that that would be very very serious um, Okay, so that's why some hyperplexia mutations are recessive and some are dominant. Now, the reason that in the dominant case you don't just upregulate the expression of the healthy gene is because the mutation in the dominant case was being incorporated into the glycine receptors, so you did have the right number of glycine receptors in the postsynaptic membrane. It's just a bunch of them weren't functioning, and it's not that that's measured, basically. So the cell is just looking at the number of them it's got, and if it's got the right number, it won't activate the other healthy gene to make more, basically. So um, the fact that it's incorporated into the receptor and looks like you've made a proper good receptor is fooling the cell basically into not making any more ones that actually are functional okay so that's why uh, these mutations that are less serious mutations are actually more dangerous basically and are dominantly inherited okay so thanks for watching this video